I'm Lizzie Dunkley with Open Affairs TV, and I'm here with Richard Boyd, a uh, technology man, innovation man, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin. Yeah, my new title is Director of Emerging and Disruptive Technology, but as a, I like what Anish Chopra calls me, Disruptive, disruptive man. man. Put that on a license plate. I think you should, I think you should. So you were, you were here at HIMSS 12, mm -hmm. um, and I know that you were here last year. What were you talking about last year at HIMSS? Yeah, last year I, I, I batted clean up with the uh, keynotes and actually had to follow Michael J. Fox, which, which was unfair in, 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 in a way, but also gave me an opportunity to sort of lighten the mood a little bit and talk about uh, how we can harness simulation and computer gaming technologies to both uh, uh, reduce the number of errors that we have in healthcare, but also just improve performance and how we're doing it in just about every other industry in the world and healthcare seems to be among the last um, when we're starting to harness that, that proven capability. Mm -hmm. Great, so um, you're, you're here uh, in 2012. What's kind of changed for you? How has the product developed in the last year? Well, I, I think first of all, uh, uh, we've just had over the last year incredible validation for everything that we said before. Mm -hmm. I, I, I now, uh, uh, in fact, next next week I'll be speaking at the uh, 32nd Annual Cardiothoracic Surgery Symposium, and, and the title of my talk is A Simulation Prescription for Healthcare. In other words, this is what everybody should be doing if you're not already doing it. But I'm, we're finding that everywhere I go, people are already sort of converted to that concept. Um, but again, it's the idea that a lot of the things that we do in aviation today, and of course my, I'm here from Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. we uh, have essentially engineered uh, human error out of the system, mm -hmm. right? So three out of the last four years, or I think it's now four out of the last five years, we've had zero fatalities in aviation. Over 700 million people take off every year, 10 million flights, no deaths. And it's a very complex activity, but we do things like what Atul Gawande has been talking about, you know, checklists. Uh, system of systems engineering, safety interlocks, uh, uh, simulation training, that sort of thing, and, and that's why um, you know we have the record that, that we have. So, uh, how can doctors and physicians and, and medical students really leverage what you're building um, to well, to learn? Well, one of the things we believe strongly is is anytime you're trying to solve something that's complex or you're trying to put a human in a complex environment if you're gonna if you want them to be able to take advantage of some of these advanced capabilities like simulation and augmented reality and some of the other things we're exploring you've got to reduce the friction right so you can't go in with a proprietary platform with with uh, uh, where, where it's difficult to contribute to the system that sort of thing so I mean, that's what's great about the internet. We now have this sort of, you know, more than a decade or almost two decades now of, of experience in seeing how, uh, how the community comes together to solve complex problems using the internet. So it's the whole idea of, uh, of you know, uh, uh, just get rough consensus and running code and, and small pieces loosely joined, all those little internet networking effects things. So at, at Lockheed, what we did, and, and it surprised our government customer quite a bit, is we went to them and said, Hey, the right way to get simulation everywhere is to make this open source. So to to uh, open it up completely, and and don't you know create a big government program and, and try to create the entire huge system and think about what everybody's going to want to have to do, right? Instead, you just do what Linus Torvalds did, right? Which is you create the kernel, the uh, essentially the software heart of the system, right? And then create rules that allow people to contribute to it. And it's what I call a massively parallel contribution system. And that's how you get really complex uh, solutions to complex problems. Um, you've reduced that friction, so now not only is it easy to contribute to it, but it's easy for people now to pick it up and use it. So the only requirement of our new uh, 3D internet system for simulation, which the DoD still calls, I think, the virtual world, virtual world framework for training, is that the only thing you, that's required is a web browser. So Firefox, Chrome, any of the modern web browsers. So if you want to meet someone in a virtual 3D environment and do something really interesting, you just say, hey, do you have a compute device with a web browser? And I don't care if it's an iPad, an Android device, iPhone, or a laptop, or something, or even a holodeck. We actually patented a holodeck last year. That's a whole other talk we can talk about. Um, but it doesn't matter what it is. If you can just say, hey, if you have that accessibility, I'll meet you in that environment. I can take you through the 37-step process for setting up that infusion pump or that communication system. Then I can step back and say, now you do it, and I can watch you do it. So you've got every medium ever used before in communication available to you, and that's what's great about synthetic environments like virtual worlds. Um, and you've got that accessibility problem solved. 
So no unnatural acts are required. You can just pick up your device, go to a web page, and meet other people in really uh, in, uh, intense environments or, or complex environments and solve problems together. Take advantage of simulation, finally. That, that's really interesting. Um, are, are you looking at integrating other devices as well, like a Kinect and, and being able to, to use that in your platform as well? Absolutely, and, and, and I think that's another huge trend over the last year, and mm -hmm. I talked about that a little bit last year at, at, at my HIMSS keynote, is, is the increasing sort of ambient nature of interfaces, right? Everything's becoming more natural. Um, and I like to think of it, I'm a chess player, so I think about it in terms of chess. You know, you have the opening game, the middle game, and then the end game. And I think the opening game of the information age is now over. In the, in the first stage of it, it was, it was humans creating devices and then, and then adapting ourselves to these things we created, right? So learning how to type and how to interface with it on its terms. And what's happening today is the things we've made are now adapting back to us. So it's, you're, you're going to see things like being able to walk into your, uh, your, uh, you know, your living room and just give commands by voice to your television. Go to ESPN, turn on this game, or bring up this recording, and it will do that. And I think last year I told some stories about my, um, my uh, at the time, five-year-old daughter, and how at two years old, she, uh, I caught her one day in the, in the living room swiping her hand across the, the screen. And of course, like any good parent, I yelled at her, said, stop, don't do that, don't touch the rapidly depreciating asset there, right? Um, and, and, and I said, what are you trying to do? And she's like, I'm trying to change the channel. And see, she'd grown up with an iPad. She had an, I mean, an iPod Touch when she was 18 months old. So, you know, and I thought about it for a second, and I thought, you know, why doesn't it work the way you expect it to? And it should, and that's the expectations of the digital natives, right? Is that, mm -hmm. is that the the, uh, the the world's going to be more intelligent, and devices will respond to us in a more natural way. So our viewers here at Open Affairs TV are really, really interested in in open technology, open architecture. So, so how you had mentioned that you you kind of created this open platform. Uh, how do people have access to it? Uh, is it just on the Lockheed site, or and and what have you learned in making it open? Um, uh, I think it's going to be opened in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, the licensing itself will be a uh, sort of like the Apache license, so it completely opens uh, open uh, um, uh, environment. Um, although, if some people want to be able to take aspects of it from the community and go do something, they don't have a requirement to give back. And we find that that's actually a useful thing to, because some people are concerned about uh, too much openness, especially in the government and elsewhere. So that the licensing terms are, are there, and also. Uh, um, I believe that whether or not we actually get really organized and start creating a lot of websites where people can get access to the, to, to the uh, code we build, it's going to take off anyway because it's already leveraging things like WebGL, JavaScript, HTML5, which are already uh, sort of taking on lives of their own. Um, but we do expect within the next couple of months we're going to finish that software heart, that kernel, just like Linus Torvalds you know, created. Uh, the kernel for Linux and then just said have at it. He didn't try to create the whole system. Uh, so we'll finish that here within the next couple of months, early, you know, midway through 2012. That will be uh, uh, provided by the government to the, you know, to everybody openly and I think a lot of other people will then hopefully set up mirror sites and get the word out there and that massively parallel contribution system I talked about will take hold and networking effects will make our lives all better, <laughs> in the simulation world at least. So, so like I mentioned, we're here at HIMSS. Uh, what are you most excited to see here? Um, well, uh, I guess I, I, I'm really excited to, to see the, uh, I, I spent a lot of time looking at RFID sorts of things, and, and uh, as I said, I'm really interested in, in the, the workplace environment, that, especially these really complex environments like hospitals and surgical environments, to see the world become a little more intelligent and more responsive and discoverable, right? Um, we're doing a lot of that sort of thing in education, um, uh, but, uh, but being able to see like uh, devices call out and say, here I am and here's what I am, and help us, right? Because I, someone was telling me recently that uh, healthcare workers can spend up to a third of their time just trying to locate things. And, uh, and, and having the environment be more intelligent and then providing the, uh, and pro providing humans with these new superhuman sort of augmented reality capabilities, I find incredibly exciting. Because I do think that as complexity continues and inevitably it will, uh, you've got to help us help poor dumb humans by giving us the, both of those things. It's got to be, uh, 
um, you know, comfortable fluency with all these digital tools we've been talking about, and then an environment that, that is intelligent and open to inquiry. And, and uh, those things coming together will, will allow us to reduce mistakes, perform better, and uh, hopefully get to that uh, last chapter of the information age I was talking about. Fantastic. And I don't know if that's the singularity and <laughs> machines wake up or whatever it is, but hopefully it's some sort of symbiotic relationship between humans and automation that optimize outcomes. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. What did I just say? <laughs> optimize Op outcomes. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, achieving the correct balance between humans and automation to optimize outcomes. I think that is the chief challenge of the 21st century. Well, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to chat with us today. Again, uh, this is Lizzie Dunkley at Open Affairs TV. Thank you.